Gary Painter and I direct the Homelessness Policy Research Institute, which is roughly a, a group of 70 researchers who have a common mission. And, and that mission is to accelerate equitable and culturally informed solutions to ending homelessness here in Los Angeles County. And the way we do it is by advancing knowledge and creating transformational partnerships between research practice and uh, people who are making decisions and policy. Um, today's symposium addresses an issue that is of preeminent importance, especially here in the Los Angeles region. And um, as you'll see from the people that we've gathered, we have a terrific panel of people who are on the front lines who are trying to figure out how to connect the people who are experiencing homelessness better um, so that they can be, you know, uh, so that they can actually be housed. Um, and so this symposium will focus on some of the best practices around research and also highlight some of the challenges that we face um, when we are trying to connect people who are unhoused to housing resources. Um, the symposium will be structured as such. Um, we first are really pleased to have Lyndon Bond, who's a PhD candidate at NYU's Silver Work of Social Work. Um, she not only has an MSW, she's worked as a clinical social worker and a clinical supervisor in homeless outreach and supportive services, but she's also presenting a paper uh, with her co-authors on, on uh, actual uh, evaluation of an, an outreach program in the city of New York. During her presentation, you can feel free to put your questions in the Q&A button um, on your Zoom screen, and also in that Q&A, um, if you have a clarifying question, just put in parentheses clarifying before you ask that. If, if that's the case, I'll be happy to interrupt um, and ask Lyndon to clarify. Otherwise, she'll be presenting for roughly you know, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time for Q&A about her research. After that, Dr. Belisha Adams-Kellum will moderate a panel, and I'll say more about that at that time. Um, so without uh, further ado, let me turn it over to you, Lyndon, so you can present some of the research that your team has done. So great. Thank you so much for um, having me today um, at HPRI. Um, again, my name is Lyndon Bond. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I am a PhD candidate at NYU Silver School of Social Work. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting a paper that I wrote um, with my co-authors, Christina Wusnick and Dr. Deborah Padgett um, at NYU as well. And the paper is called Weighing the Options, Service User Perspectives on Homeless Outreach Services. Um, and it's currently in um, the journal Qualitative Social Work. Next slide. Great. Um, so as folks probably know, right, homeless outreach programs um, are a key way in which folks who are living unsheltered can be connected to services. Um, these programs are defined pretty broadly. Um, HUD defines it sort of as essential services necessary to reach out to folks who are unsheltered, um, whether individuals and families, and connect them with housing or critical services and provide them with urgent non-facility-based care. Um, so the target sort of um, group of folks homeless outreach teams work with are people living unsheltered. In 2020, um, this number was estimated to be over 200,000 individuals living across the United States. Um, in New York, where I um, do research and I practiced, um, that number is about 4,000, although we think it's probably higher than that. Um, so previous research um, focused on homeless outreach programs has sort of focused on like specific aspects of it, including outcomes, connecting folks to housing, um, cost and provider experiences and the challenges they face in doing this work. Um, but there's really been limited attention towards the experiences of those who are actually engaged by outreach workers. Um, in addition, sort of the re research that has been done um, examining sort of experiences of service users has really focused on um, people who are long term or chronically homeless. Um, even though we know that many people experience only episodic or temporary homelessness um, who are living unsheltered as well. Um, so among the research that really has been conducted um, to explore experiences with homeless outreach programs, um, the findings have really found that people have negative perceptions of homeless outreach services. Um, one study noted that among um, 
individuals deemed as chronically homeless, there's sort of this pervasive mistrust of outreach workers. Um, and service users of homeless services in general have sort of expressed negative experiences with workers, including lack of compassion, disrespect, and sort of this arbitrary decision-making. Um, in addition, homeless outreach programs, sort of the literature has found that um, these programs sometimes offer a few choices to people experiencing homelessness. Despite the research and the clinical recommendations that suggest that people um, be offered services, not just services that they need, but also um, services that meet their preferences. Next slide. Great. Um, so this study is guided by the socio-rational choice model, um, which is a conceptual framework that posits that individuals have really complex ways of determining the value of services to them. Um, which includes things like weighing the costs and the benefits of actually using the service. Um, so in this paper, we use this framework as a lens to view and understand individuals' experiences with homeless outreach programs. Um, so this study considered two relevant questions using concepts from the socio-rational choice model, um, which our research questions are as follows. Um, how do experiences with homeless outreach workers affect the way um, individuals living unsheltered determine the utility of these services offered by the outreach programs? Um, so this question really asks about the impact of the interactions with these frontline um, outreach providers on individual perceptions of like the usefulness of services offered and how they weigh these costs and benefits of engaging um, with homeless outreach workers and sort of the programs they work for. Um, the second question um, of this paper was what specific factors related to outreach interactions are involved in individuals' decisions to use or reject services um, from outreach programs? And so, again, this question really seeks to describe the patterns um, and the factors related to the experiences of outreach workers. Um, so we're essentially asking, like, what is it about interactions with outreach workers that affects the perceptions of the usefulness of the services that they're offered? Um, and subsequently, right, the perceived costs and benefits um, of these services. This um, paper came out of a larger study which examined um, barriers to accessing housing um, and the survival strategies of um, unsheltered homeless New Yorkers. And um, we use geographic and gender stratified random sampling to sample participants um, around Manhattan in New York City. Um, we included areas um, that included two large transportation hubs in a downtown public park. We really tried to maximize representation of um, folks living unsheltered in the city by conducting interviews both on weekdays and weekends and sort of in the daytime and evening hours, trying to get a broad range of perspectives. Um, and we data collection took place in 2017. So inclusion criteria for this larger study um, were being 18 years or older, English speaking, and currently experiencing street homelessness. Um, we approached individuals who were um, on the street, on the sidewalks of New York City. We didn't approach anyone who was sleeping or um, visibly intoxicated. Um, all study protocols were approved by the IRB at NYU. Um, and we did semi-structured qualitative interviews, which lasted between 15 and 15 minutes and two hours um, with all of our participants. Next slide. Um, so after conducting all of our interviews, um, which totaled 43 interviews um, with 43 individual participants, we transcribed the interviews verbatim and then reviewed them for accuracy. Um, so we coded this um, full data set as part of this larger study. And any time a participant sort of spoke about their experiences with outreach programs um, or outreach workers, we coded that as outreach experiences. So this study specifically um, uses all of those expert excerpts coded as outreach experiences. And um, we only included participants in this um, study who reported engaging with outreach workers. So folks who had never engaged with an outreach team or an outreach worker, um, didn't have any experiences with them to include in this data set. Um, so for data analysis and interpretation, um, we used a theory guided approach. Um, and so by theory guided, um, I'm really referring to using the influence of the socio-rational choice model, as well as our prior knowledge um, of related research um, as a way to sensitize our analysis. Um, so we didn't you know, begin with this fully inductive coding um, that a lot of qualitative research um, begins with. And so 
Um, with that, we conducted second level coding to really identify higher level themes related to our research questions. Um, so the research team met and discussed emergent themes until we were able to reach consensus on what that looked like. Um, and is sort of common with theory guided research, we also use negative case analysis. Um, to both identify sort of patterns and themes across the data, but also exceptions to those patterns and themes, because we know that, um, you know, not everyone necessarily has these exact same experiences. So this is sort of an overview of our sample and um, our themes. So our final sample included 38 individuals. Um, these were all the participants who had experience is engaging with outreach workers and outreach teams um, from that um, overall data set. Um, over half, so about 53% reported lifetime homelessness greater than one year, um, whereas, you know, that 47% um, had experienced either short-term homelessness um, or sort of episodic homelessness. Um, we, as we, as I mentioned, sort of we stratified um, by gender, and so we had about 75% of our sample identify as male, um, with the remaining approximately a quarter identifying as female. Um, over half our sample identified as white, um, about a third as Black or African American, and about 13% as Hispanic. Um, and we really had a wide range in years um, of our sample, ranging from 21 years old to 74 years old. So our five main themes, um, which I'll go into in a little bit of detail um, shortly, that we identified were credibility, transparency, offering choices, bureaucracy, and opportunity cost. The first theme that we identified, um, we called credibility, right? They tried to help me and I never see them again. So based on past experiences, um, stories from other folks who were um, engaging with outreach teams, and sort of general perceptions of outreach workers and their intentions, um, folks made a judgment of how much to believe or buy into the offers made by outreach workers. Um, so participants reported that they felt the intentions of outreach workers were not actually necessarily aimed at addressing homelessness um, and that outreach workers did not always follow through um, with offers of help. So these are a couple of quotes I pulled um, just to show sort of what we mean by credibility. So um, one participant said, they, the outreach workers, just come in the morning and ask me stuff. They act like they're doing something. They see me every day. They walk up to you every day and talk to you like they're doing something and walk around full of shit people, right? So this person sort of not really buying in to um, what the outreach workers are saying to him and finding them sort of not as a credible source of information or help. Um, another quote, what do they tell me to hold on? Wait, stuff like that. You know what I mean? They try to help me and I never see them again. It's like a one-time thing. I see one person and I never see them again. Um, so believing whether or not outreach workers were truly helping folks, um, move through a process that would eventually end in what they wanted and needed, um, which was housing really played a large, um, role in participating, um, or engaging with outreach teams. Next slide. Great. Thank you. Um, so our next theme we identified was transparency, um, which we sort of identified as superficial encounters um, versus truly meaningful engagement. Um, so a factor in choosing to accept services was this perceived transparency or a lack thereof um, related to the aims and the goals of outreach teams and outreach programs um, in the process of obtaining services and what outreach workers were actually offering. Um, so participants commonly reported what they felt were sort of superficial encounters with outreach teams, um, including one that was commonly described by many participants where an outreach worker um, asked them for their name and date of birth um, without offering, you know, concrete services or support. Um, participants described frustration with a lack of explanation or further information, um, especially since the immediate need of finding permanent housing or transitional housing was not addressed in these interactions. Um, similarly, some participants reported that they didn't actually understand what the outreach worker's purpose was um, and that the outreach workers themselves weren't always clear. Um, we had one participant describe an example of where they said they could enter a transitional housing placement with their pet only to come back and say they don't actually accept pets. Um, so a couple quotes that sort of describe this um, theme of transparency. So the outreach workers just come here for about five minutes uh, to check your name. 
they say they're going to go back to the office. So I guess putting your information or something and that's it, but there's no explanation or anything. Um, so right, this participant sort of describing this process of being asked um, their name, but not quite sure what the next steps were. Um, another example of this, right? I said, it's getting very cold out. If you can't get me in some place, you know, then I really don't need your help. Coming around and asking me how I'm doing, how I'm doing, how do you think I'm doing? You know, either help me or leave me alone. Um, so not being able to be transparent about sort of what this process is um, and what the outreach workers were able to do to help. Next slide. Um, so our third theme we called offering choices and supporting autonomy. Um, so some participants described their experiences with outreach workers as helpful and expressed that they offered choices of available services, um, which allowed them to have autonomy in their own decision making about what services to engage with or not engage with. Um, others discussed the importance of being able to make decisions about service use that was best for them, and that included not working with outreach teams. Um, and so one example of this, right, like he, the outreach worker, told me, listen, I'm going to make a little deal with you, okay? I mean, you don't have to accept it if, you know, you say you don't want to. Um, this outreach worker said, pick whatever day you want me to come and pick you up. Um, we have two facilities. We can go to East Harlem. We can go to one in the Bronx. And you can decide which of the two you want to go to. Um, and so this participant sort of really described that it was meaningful um, to them that the outreach worker was able to sort of offer these choices and say, look, you can, we can take a tour of this place. We can go to this place. Or you don't have to choose um, either one at all. Um, this other quote, so that's why we are going through the VA, um, because the veterans will, you know, do it for us together because we're legally married, but it makes no sense if they want to have this separately. So this is a quote of um, a man who um, was living unsheltered with his wife and the outreach teams um, weren't able to place them together. So he really um, decided to um, make the choice to seek services elsewhere where he would be more supported in um, what he was looking for. Um, and so while some people had positive experiences, um, I do want to sort of also note that others found every teams were unable to offer the options that they wanted. Um, you know, for example, we had some participants um, tell us that the offers of emergency shelter um, through DHS, right, we know um, New York City has a right to shelter. And so every person who's um, sleeping on the streets or the subways does have the option to go to a shelter um, or referrals to things like food and clothing were not actually that helpful because they knew how to get those things. And what they really wanted was an apartment um, or permanent housing, but they weren't actually offered that. Okay, next story, next one. Um, so our fourth theme um, was bureaucracy, right? This burden of bureaucratic constraints on being able to make decisions. Um, so the experiences of bureaucracy were common throughout participant reports. Um, participants became aware of the bureaucracy of the system through which services in New York are offered um, through these interactions with outreach workers. Um, they reported sort of onerous and hard to meet requirements, such as needing to be seen multiple times um, by outreach workers in order to verify their length of homelessness. Um, and across participants, there was this confusion about how long or um, how often they needed to be engaged by outreach teams in order um, to be eligible for certain services or to get sort of this um, meet this chronically homeless definition in New York City. Um, and then participants also reported that there was like this lack of coordination between outreach teams and then other services also funded by the city, um, which created unnecessary barriers to accessing services that people want. Um, so the second quote sort of exemplifies that. Um, this participant says, they had a bed for me and everything, um, talking about a transitional housing program. And when they came to get me, they told me I have to sleep for a month outside in order for my name to be cleared from one system in the city shelter system um, in order for me to be a part of their program. So sort of this um, bureaucratic policy that ended up with this gentleman having to sleep outside for um, longer than sort of anyone should be sleeping outside. Um, similarly, this other person sort of talks about the steps in this process by saying, I'm just waiting for the outreach workers to go, okay, we've seen you enough times. We're ready to go um, to the next step. And so um, a perception of like this moving target and unclear standards um, as it relates to these um, policies related to program eligibility were common. Um, and for some, I'll just say outreach workers were able to offer specific concrete services, um, such as getting documentation, sort of helping folks move along in this um, process. 
So our last um, theme we identified was opportunity cost, right? Like, is it worth the effort? Um, so the time and energy required to move through this process of obtaining services um, is substantial for people. And um, our participants specifically noted this as reasons for not wanting to accept services or not wanting to engage with outreach workers. Um, they sort of said the time and energy it took to get a case manager to actually access housing um, was substantial. And again, sort of like a reason that they didn't even want to bother with it. Um, when the time and energy seemed like it was worth the effort, participants did express they were willing to engage. Um, so for example, someone described he felt the process was uncomplicated and he was ready to go through it and sort of ready to, to get his housing. Um, on the other hand, so right, he says, I'm definitely going there in the transitional housing program soon because of the bed. Everyone I know that's been there got a place. They said their place there. It's nice, it's clean. Um, so he felt like it was really worth the time and energy to go through these steps um, in order to get into this program. Um, on sort of the other side of this, this participant said, the outreach workers make it a big drawn out process and that they got issues. They hit you with the bullshit where they got to say, sorry, we have to see you five times in the same area. You know, that's ridiculous. And to this participant, it wasn't worth his time or energy to try to be seen um, those five times in order to move forward. As I sort of just explained, we this study found five main themes related to the perceptions of usefulness and utility um, of homeless outreach services among service users. Um, so people make decisions to engage with outreach workers and outreach teams um, by calculating sort of these weighing elements, such as the utility of the offered services um, and their alternative options, um, which are really shaped by determinants in their environment, like interactions with the outreach workers. Um, so it wasn't necessarily just um, not just the services that didn't um, that influenced people's decisions to work with outreach workers, but also the interactions themselves. Um, so we our application of the socio-rational choice model um, really doesn't place all responsibility onto the system, onto the outreach workers, or onto um, service users themselves. But um, we really think it provides a partial understanding of how service users think and respond to certain kinds of services um, that are offered, but also to outreach workers themselves. Um, so among previous research, um, similar reasons for declining to work with outreach teams included lack of trust and perception and lack of credibility. Um, we also you know, found similar findings, but we extended these findings um, to not just include people who had been long-term homeless, who maybe had been engaging with outreach teams for um, years, but also people who had been short-term homeless and um, perhaps were newly engaged with the system. Um, our study found that positive characteristics of engaging with outreach teams included things like offering choices and helping with concrete services. Um, and again, this aligns with previous research um, that found that if we offer services that are aligned with preferences, it's really effective in, episode, in ending episodes of homelessness. Um, so understanding these components um, really reveals um, areas of the system that can be improved, including not only what services are offered, but how outreach workers are actually engaging with individuals and what information they're providing. So I do think it's important always to mention sort of strengths and limitations of our study. Um, I think the study has a few really great strengths. One is um, we were able to have a random sample from multiple diverse neighborhoods in New York, um, not just focusing on um, neighborhoods with like a large number of folks living unsheltered, um, but some other neighborhoods where perhaps other outreach teams um, go more frequently or less frequently. Um, we included individuals who had been unsheltered um, both short-term and long-term. Um, in our analysis, we used multiple strategies for rigor. We co-coded um, and we used group, group debriefing. Um, and our findings really provide insight from individuals who are really the target um, community of homeless outreach teams. Um, so people who are living unsheltered are who these outreach teams are providing services to, and that's who we were able to sample from. Um, on the other hand, our sample may be limited in that those who successfully engage with outreach teams and outreach programs, um, they may already be in housing. So people who had perhaps different experiences aren't um, still living unsheltered. And then just in the landscape of New York, um, there's really multiple homeless outreach programs um, and outreach teams that work throughout the city. And so um, some programs may um, operate differently than others. So as far as recommendations go when we're thinking about homeless outreach, um, 
programs should be able to provide options to unsheltered individuals um, that they're looking for and really respect autonomy and making service use decisions um, rather than sort of you know, shifting to the service resistant narrative, outreach programs should be able to say what are the services um, that folks are looking for that they would be open to accepting. Um, and outreach workers should be able to be transparent in their service eligibility criteria, sort of minimizing um, the bureaucracy in order to access things like case management or permanent housing um, would be beneficial. And then last sort of policies at the program level and at the community level should ensure that outreach workers are able to offer services um, that sort of work within these elements of coordinated entry, um, both accurately assessing individual needs, but also preferences and being able to provide low barrier housing options that don't require some of the bureaucracy our participants um, expressed. And with that, I will end it there. Thank you so much. Um, this is sort of the title um, of our full paper. It's in qualitative social work. My information's on there. Um, and yeah, thank you. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Lyndon. Um, I, there's a few questions from the audience. Um, others, just as a reminder, go ahead and type your question in the Q&A box. We won't have the capability to uh, allow you to ask your question directly. Um, there was first a minor question, Lyndon, just about your sample. Were any of the, the, home, the individuals or couples that you talked to, um, did they have kids with them? And, and if so, did that provide any barrier for finding housing? Um, we did not interview anyone with kids. I think in general, sort of the New York landscape, you don't, um, we don't have very many families with children, um, living unsheltered. We have a right to shelter for families. There's a process for it. Um, but there, there's more accessible family options in New York. Great. Um, and then Sarah Hunter, who's a researcher at, at the Rand Corporation, um, wondered if in presenting, have you had a chance to present these slides to what is called DHS in New York City. For us, it's Department of Health Services in Los Angeles, but Department of Homeless Services. Um, you had a list of very clear recommendations. If you have presented, have they actually changed how they approach outreach based on such work? Um, this is a great question. Um, so this study was sort of prompted by an advocacy group um, that I, Trans, in full transparency, I was not involved in um, when we did this research, but now I am sort of trying to make it easier for folks um, to move into housing. DHS is well aware um, of our recommendations. Sort of there's been advocacy campaigns with a lot of the um, organizations that work with folks who are living unsheltered in New York, sort of pushing for these things, um, but no huge changes yet, um, unfortunately. But did you have, com or you, so you had direct conversations about the study or just kind of vis-a-vis -vis the advocacy groups? Um, we've also met with um, electeds and folks at DHS sort of presenting these findings. Um, DHS is a fan of data, as are many people. Um, so we presented this study to them. And I think that there's still some sort of discordance among um, their views of outreach teams and. Right service users views. Thank you. Um, so another question just had to do with turnover. Did Is this an issue that you, the people that you interviewed mentioned that they had had experiences with multiple outreach workers? Um, if, if, if so, or maybe you could sp speak more generally about turnover among outreach workers and whether that is perceived as a challenge or barrier? Um, I don't know if turnover necessarily came up in our interviews. I think it sort of came up just in like someone comes and you never see them again um, in the sense that there's no sort of consistent engagement or people aren't sure like how to be consistently engaged. Um, but I don't necessarily think like the, the high turnover among staff um, was was specifically cited as a reason. Great. Another question had to do with the type of um, offer. It, was it the sense in terms of the offer of housing resource that, you know, some were just a crowded shelter or or was there a lack of clarity? I think you spoke a little bit about this. Yeah. So um, New York's um, homeless services system is complicated, mm -hmm. um, but typically because we have a right to shelter, anyone, um, any single adult um, can go to the city's intake shelter and access a bed right then. Um, so people who are living um, on the streets or the subways are always offered that as an option. Um, but right, this is sort of this least desirable offer for many, many reasons. We also have another paper out sort of describing these reasons why people don't want to go to shelters. Um, they find them dangerous. 
um, and they're crowded. And um, I mean, now, right, like also there's this public health aspect of it. Um, so there's that. And then working with our teams, um, our teams also sort of place people into transitional beds, um, like safe havens or stabilization beds. But those um, we are limited and we don't have enough beds for everyone who wants them, which is sort of where these changing requirements come up of like needing to be seen or verify um, chronicity or length of homelessness in order to be eligible for those, um, which sort of creates this barrier of trying to become eligible for something. So I have just a, a question that what well, didn't come up in the chat, but related to another question. Um, do you, you gave us the demographics of the population that you had interviewed. Is that mm -hmm. um, relatively representative in terms of the population? I saw that the majority of your sample were white individuals. Yeah, so this is um, interesting and I've thought a lot about this. So New York with the HOPE count, which is our point in time count and sort of with the information we have, um, is really focused um, when it comes to demographics, including race, is more of the shelter system. And the majority of folks in the shelter system are um, Black or Hispanic um, people of color. Whereas just anecdotally, and I haven't been able to find necessarily like any official data on this, um, people who are living unsheltered in New York um, tend to, there's like a higher rate of folks who are white living unsheltered um, than compared to the shelter system in New York. So we think it's um, representative, but I, I can't 100% con confirm that. Okay, um, related to, to that, um, I, I think it's generally true in the literature, but I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong based on your research that it can be the case that the, the race or ethnicity or identity of the person who is the outreach worker can have an impact on those interactions. Did any of your uh, respondents mention race or ethnicity of the outreach worker? And if so, how did that affect their um, you know, willingness or connection to, to them? Yeah, for this study, I don't um, think that actually came up at all. Thinking back sort of about people's reasons for engaging or not engaging, um, anecdotally, and I think this came up at least in perhaps one interview, just feeling like outreach workers in general couldn't connect um, mm -hmm. with the experiences that people were having was sort of a barrier. But I don't think anyone specifically reported um, like race or ethnicity as being a primary barrier or um, factor in choosing to engage with, with services. Great. And we're giving you rapid fire questions here, Linda. Yeah. Thank you for answering them so clearly. Um, so there's a question from Michael Cousineau in the audience um, about whether you think the outcomes may have been a bit different if people were able to offer other other than housing resources, things like medical care, food, or something else as part of the encounter. Yes, I do. I think um, in this particular research study, it didn't necessarily come up. There was sort of this... Um, Right, this theme that came through of people saying like they're offering me things that I can get on my own, mm -hmm. like food or clothing um, or emergency shelter. Um, outreach teams also offer things like, do you need to go to detox? Do you need to go to the emergency room? I'm meeting these um, immediate needs, but I think sort of coming from mm -hmm. my practice, my social work experience, mm -hmm. if outreach teams were able to offer things like this in the moment, like actually provide food and um, provide medical care on the spot, which I think mm -hmm. they're sort of starting to do and the system's changing a little bit, that can create a different rapport um, with folks than just saying like, do you know where the soup kitchen is? Mm -hmm. Like, here's a cup of coffee. Here's something that you need right. in this moment. Um, but again, to my knowledge, our teams are not doing that except for the medical care. I think um, we're starting to do that That's here. Fine. Good. Um, so there's a question that isn't directly related to this study, I believe, but it may be part of the broader work that you're doing. Do you, in your team's work, have you investigated how the skills or experience of the outreach workers themselves can affect kind of that encounter of outreach? Um, we have not. Um, I think that's a really important piece of this. And um, for example, if the outreach workers have lived experience of homelessness, again, it didn't necessarily come up a lot in this study, but sort of in general um, conversations I've had with folks in um, mm -hmm. outside of this research lens, um, this idea of lived experience and peer workers has been successful in places like Philadelphia. Um, and I do think that that could be a, an important way um, to engage with folks and sort of build increased transparency and credibility among outreach workers. 
Um, and then also sort of previous literature has found that um, folks who are working in homeless services, like these frontline folks um, who are engaging with people living unsheltered mm -hmm. are not necessarily social workers who don't have specific um, training related to that, um, which could be different if um, they had a perhaps were social workers or had some sort of different, um, more specific training. Great. Uh, one of our uh, attendees, Dottie Russell, noted or asked the question about how much resources available through SSDI disability insurance. Um, is that sufficient for people that may have a disability? And this, again, is outside your scope, but you're from New York, and so you may have. Yeah. Um, uh, from my understanding, the amount you get on SSDI is not enough to pay rent in New York unless you're able to get into um, an affordable housing or a supportive housing program where your rent is capped um, at 30 percent. It is. Yeah. Unfortunately, not nearly enough. So I think th this question I find really interesting from uh, Anjali Browning about you know, the sampling strategy here. So you're you're actually engaging with people who are on the streets who are not actually in the shelter system already. Um, how do you feel that that might skew your results as it relates to kind of somewhat, you know, negative experiences with outreach workers? Um, and if so, how would you interpret those results vis-a-vis -vis those um, people who were experiencing homelessness but are now in a, the shelter system? Yeah, I think that's a really important question, and that's a limitation of our study, right? For um, folks who have su really successfully engaged and gone through this whole process, um, we wouldn't have sampled them because they wouldn't still be um, living unsheltered. I would say, though, um, sort of in thinking about our sample, there were people who had engaged with our teams and sort of were in this process of working through the the process of accessing housing through an outreach team um so not necessarily that they were having negative experiences and i hope that came through of things like offering different choices being able to help with um someone mentioned like getting help with the divorce or um getting help and getting documents um so perhaps it did sort of potentially skew on towards like people who had negative experiences since they're still, um, they weren't able to engage successfully with outreach teams um, for the reasons we found. But um, I think our findings sort of generally showed these different aspects that all folks would encounter. Okay. Ho great. Hopefully that was clear enough. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, there was also a question from Sophia Herrera about um, whether you saw, I mean, you don't have a huge sample size, but did you see any patterns among men versus women or maybe by race, ethnicity, you didn't point to any of any differences there. We didn't. Um, so yeah, so with this qualitative work, we didn't specifically like pull out subgroups and look at different experiences. Um, sort of across the board, people seem to report similar things. Um, so I don't know if I have a great, great answer for that. Um, Can't have I would answers say for everything. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, but I think that's really important to look at sort of in the future of, of those different sort of subgroup experiences. And again, slightly outside of this study, but may have come up, um, were any of the outreach workers that you know of connected to, um, you know, faith-based organizations? Um, and if so, did, was there any conversation around, you know, that those outreach workers versus those who were from non-faith-based? So we asked specific specifically about um, engagement with outreach teams and sort of tried to probe um, for if those were DHS contracted outreach teams mm -hmm. or if we asked like, what were they wearing? Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember the name of the organization? And like, what did that encounter look like? Um, I don't think um, we had any like faith-based organizations um, that came up repeatedly. Um, when we were doing our, our interviews, there are like a few sort of um, groups of folks who like hand out food and do things like that, who we saw and engage with folks, but really our um, primary sort of understanding and who folks were talking about were the um, DHS contracted outreach providers. Um, and that's really who has all the access to the, the transitional housing beds okay. um, in New York. Makes sense. So, yeah, uh, someone in the chat, Deborah Paget, is noting that uh, <laughs> many faith-based organizations are quite small, so they may not have these these contracts. I guess final question, okay. because we'll go ahead and and move to the panel. And this has been a great way to tee off the panel. And many of the questions, in fact, are slightly outside of your your research specific research. <laughs> but from what you've heard from from in New York, how has COVID nineteen affected 
kind of outreach and or the interactions from outreach teams. So again, beyond your research that you presented because it was pre-pandemic. Yeah, so our research was pre-pandemic, but um, I think COVID-19 sort of affected the work of outreach teams in a few ways. One is that the city was actually able to quickly open up um, more stabilization beds and more access to things like um, hotel rooms that some were single, some were shared to sort of move people off the streets quickly. Um, anecdotally, I've heard that sort of some of these like bureaucratic processes were um, mm -hmm. minimized or sort of let go during, um, especially during the early stages of the pandemic to move people inside and, and try to keep folks safe. Um, and the reactions of the outreach teams, I'm not sure I have a great answer to sort of how that has changed. That makes sense. Well, Lyndon, again, thank you so much for the presentation, the work that your team is doing that you, you've been doing, and also for answering so many questions so clearly. <laughs> appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, so now we're going to turn to our panel of people who are primarily here in Los Angeles. Um, we also have someone who's doing outreach in New York to kind of connect us to, to the work that Lyndon was sharing. And I'm going to introduce our panel moderator, Dr. Felicia Adams Kellum, who's the president and CEO of St. Joseph Center. She joined St. Joseph Center in 2008, um, and during her tenure, St. Joseph Center has, has tripled its staff, expanded its range of services, and broadened its reach to encompass all of LA County. Um, many of you who are here in LA know that St. Joseph Center has been partnering with the city, the county, LASA and specifically Mike Bonin's office related to um, engaging people who were living in encampments along the Venice boardwalk. Um, I think that's enough by way of introduction. You can always fill in more if you want, uh, Alicia. Let me go ahead and turn it over to you to uh, get us started with the panel and then I can return at the end. Great, thank you so much, Gary. And it's so great to be here and to see so many people who joined us to talk about outreach. Uh, Lyndon's work in New York is uh, very interesting and intriguing. I'd love to see us do something like that here in LA. As Gary mentioned, I've been the president and CEO of St. Joseph Center for 13 years, and I've been in the homeless sector for over 20 years. I'm telling on myself, telling my age. But it um, is an honor to be here this morning, and thank you all. I St. Joseph Center has really changed my life. I've found my purpose in the work. Uh, it's actually uh, been an amazing journey, but it's only a small part of St. Joseph Center's full history. We've been around for 45 years and we provide services in four main pillars of service, outreach and engagement, housing, mental health and education and vocational services. As Gary mentioned, um, we have expanded throughout the county with our main home office uh, in Venice, but we also have offices in South Los Angeles and in downtown LA. We do a lot of work around outreach and engagement, and I'm really glad that one of our team members will uh, join today's panel and be able to talk to you a little bit about the work we did on Oceanfront Walk. But before we move on to that discussion, I'd like to have each panelist introduce themselves, uh, tell us about the work you do and how it relates to outreach and engagement. And Veronica, we'll have you start, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Veronica Morrison, and uh, I am the lead case manager on the Venice C3 outreach team with St. Joseph Center. Um, as Dr. Adams mentioned, uh, St. Joseph Center has four pillars, which is mental health, housing, education, and vocational training, and then the department that I work in, which is outreach and engagement. Um, our outreach staff oftentimes is the first interaction that potential clients have with St. Joseph Center. Um, and we have several different outreach teams assigned to various uh, areas throughout SPA 5. Um, these outreach teams consist of case managers, mental health specialists, um, and nurses, just to name a few. Um, most uh, staff do have some form of lived experience and in my opinion, um, that is really what aids our ability to be able to relate to the population that we serve. Um, when I joined St. Joseph Center, I joined as a peer specialist um, in the same way I had lived experience, um, which really did 
it, 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 it started my journey. And St. Joseph Center has really been uh, a great place for me to be able to turn my life around and really, you know, work to help those people like me, you know, single mothers or others that are just in, you know, just those, those situations. So that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I love the agency that I work for it. You know, we, we do a, a lot of work and it's, it's very, um, it's amazing. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Erica, can you go next, please? Good morning, everyone. I'm Erica Hartman, Executive Director of Safe Place for Youth. Uh, we are a youth homeless servicing organization uh, serving unhoused young people 12 to 24 in Venice and the surrounding community. Uh, our organization provides a full array of wraparound services, um, and it all starts with the incredible work done by our outreach teams. Um, and then prior to working at Safe Place for Youth, my background has been in working with unhoused women, gang involved youth and youth involved in the child welfare and juvenile justice system. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I'm Peter Malvan. I'm the homeless advocate from the Urban Justice Center and I've only been there for five months now, but I have a history of doing um, being a research assistant um, at Columbia's CTI program, um, Urban Pathway, no, no, not Urban, Pathways to Housing in 1991 to 1994. We sort of set up the housing first model, the first version of it. Um, I worked for a drop-in center from 1994 to 2010 as the outreach person um, when New York City's um, MOC, Manhattan Outreach Consortium, was formed. My agency um, was one of the components um, who went out and engaged people and tried to, actually we had some success rate at getting people into supportive housing in New York City. Um, currently, I do a lot of work involved in stopping or being the legal witness in situations where there are um, cleanups um, in New York City of persons who are on the street. Because um, although the CDC said, um, leave them, on, leave people where they are for health reasons and bring um, ways for them to maintain their hygiene, New York City has had the memo said over 1,600 DHS cleanups or sweeps from July, from March to July of this year. So I go out and I um, deal with people on the street. Um, I check out the um, sweep notices. Um, when there are sweeps, I come. If somebody needs to consolidate just to make things look neat so they won't be, everything won't be thrown in the garbage, I do that. Um, I consult with the outreach person present about getting people stories for their um, important papers, et cetera. Um, and I, I actually came out of <laughs> retirement to do it, but next wow. person. That's wonderful, Peter. Thank you so much. You do a lot and it sounds like you do great work. Thank you. John? Hi, my name is John Hellier. I'm the Associate Director for Homeless Access and Engagement at SSG Hopix. Uh, we are the CS lead and kind of a one-stop shop in SPA 6 for uh, people experiencing homelessness. We have behavioral health, we have uh, trauma recovery center, we have our housing programs, we have uh, shelters, we have benefits programs, we have a uh, health clinic, uh, we do uh, extensive outreach, uh, we have more than a dozen teams on the street throughout SPA 6, uh, and then we're services seven days a week. Um, we also have multiple access points, which I'm also um, over. And uh, I'm very excited. We're just piloting a new program through a couple of the uh, council districts for to try to identify people before they become homeless uh, to uh, prevent homelessness. So that's what we do. Great, John. Thank you so much. Sarah? 
Hi, my name is Sarah Wilson or Sarah. Um, I'm the Associate Director of Global Communications for The Hunger Project, but I'm actually here today as a volunteer organizer with an organization called SELA. Um, SELA is entirely volunteer led. We work largely on the east side of Los Angeles. Um, I'm the co-chair of the Global, or co-chair of the Communications Committee and an active outreach leader. So we do things like supply distribution, hosting showers, clothing and food drives, but we also serve as a liaison between services and our unhoused neighbors, as well as a facilitator between our housed and unhoused neighbors. Thanks, Sarah. We look forward to hearing from you today. So let's move to our first question. Veronica, as we said, you were involved with the Oceanfront Walk Project in Venice Beach. Could you talk a little bit more about the project specifically? Uh, what was it like to have to build trust out there among the unhoused population? And we know you had to do it uh, over a six week period. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. Um, so to be honest, uh, in my opinion or in my experience, um, it's, it's not really unusual uh, to build rapport quickly with clients or an individual. Um, however, the difference with Oceanfront Walk is that there was a large amount of, of people um, that bought in at the same time. You know, um, engagement piece is really where the person is at the time. And that's really where, you know, housing first and all that comes from. So, you know, again, in building rapport quickly with clients, if a client is at that place where they're ready to receive services, you know, that can move fairly quickly. Now with Oceanfront Walk, like I said, um, we were able to engage 345 individuals, um, again, in that short period of time, of which 213 of those individuals were moved indoors. Um, 33 of those have already been placed in permanent housing, and we have a current retention rate of about 85%. So that's huge um, in the sense that, you know, Again, I just really think that it was twofold um, where there was a collaborative effort um, being the first. Right. So in the collaborative collaborative effort um, came first internally with St. Joseph Center. You know, again, we have several different outreach teams. We have um, many multidisciplinary teams and they all came together. It was all hands on deck and everyone worked together collaboratively um, to aid those clients. Um, then we had outside the agency, we had LASA, um, Urban Alchemy, CD11, uh, LA Sanitation, LAPD, Department of Mental Health. Um, all of these key players were very important uh, in, in the success of this, you know, because you had individuals that had, you know, we had, um, uh, you know, substance needs or mental health needs or different things. We were able to really deal with those barriers right on the spot. We were able to identify them. We were able to get them connected to the proper services at that time. And then the second part of it was those readily available resources. Um, the resources that were there in the beginning that clients that were initially reluctant to going into any type of housing, once they saw individuals actually being moved into interim housing locations and it being successful, um, whereas that, you know, quote unquote, maybe mistrust might have been there initially kind of dissipated a little bit because Again, they were experiencing their peers and different ones, their next door neighbors going into interim housing and then being connected with the services that they need. Um, and so therefore that gave the outreach staff just, you know, tangible resources. Those things were were key in, in that engagement piece where it's like, you know, hey, these are the resources that we have to offer. What are your needs? Are your needs housing? You know, some people's needs aren't always housing first and foremost. So again, just having that engagement piece, right? You have the resource available. You have the engagement piece. Now I have some things to offer. Let's talk. Let's see what your needs are so that way we can actually get you connected to services that you feel are, are viable for you. Thank you, Veronica. And can you speak a little bit more about your own lived experience and how you feel that played into how you engage people and build rapport. Absolutely. Um, you know, the reality of it is when you're in a tough spot, you just, you want someone to handle you with love and care. You want someone to, to understand, you know, it, it's not about always just um, doing for me. 
It's just understanding where I'm coming from, understanding that, you know, I can't make the dots connect on my own at this point because I'm so overwhelmed. I just have so many things going on. Um, like I mentioned in you know my intro, I am a single mom. I was actually a teen mom. Um, I left home fairly young. And so that let, you know, late led me to being in situations where it, you know, it was just really difficult for me. I found myself, you know, lack of education and different things and, you know, just needing a little bit of support. So for me, you know, my approach to outreach is support. It's support for the client. What are your needs? I'm not here to define your needs. I'm not here to tell you what you need. You tell me what you need. And then we work on those things together, you know, and, and just, you know, helping people feel empowered, you know, empowered to be able to get their life back on track because it, you know, it, this is this too shall pass. It's, it's just a situation. And, you know, you you can be motivated same way that I was. Thank you so much. I appreciate your comments and transparency. Erica, as executive director of Safe Place for Youth, you work specifically with young people. Could you speak to some of the unique challenges that young people face when accessing services and how you and your team provide outreach uh, to those uh, folks who have significant barriers and challenges who are out there and um, really just coming of age and trying to make it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you heard mentioned, trust building is a huge component of outreach. Um, and one of the things that's unique to the circumstances of youth homelessness is that youth who are homeless became homeless because they were failed by adults um, and systems that have been designed by adults, such as DCFS and the juvenile justice system. So many youth experiencing homelessness are really fleeing environments that were abusive because of adults and had there been a loving, caring, affirming adult in their life, they would not have become homeless. So I think adult outreach workers are really um, just automatically facing a hurdle when trying to engage youth just by being adults uh, because they represent a demographic that many young people don't trust. Uh, so when it comes to trying to do outreach for youth, uh, our teams are working against many of the same challenges as workers who are focused on adult outreach, but with that added layer of mistrust of adults, which they really have to work through. Um, so one strategy that's been crucial for us has been to hire peer youth advocate outreach workers. So these are former members who've previously accessed our services and who we've hired on as staff because they've been highly effective in their ability to bridge that trust. Um, and youth aren't wrong to be cautious. Uh, the possibility that someone will call law enforcement or the Department of Child and Family Services is real. Um, and that's a general barrier for policymakers to grapple with, that there really needs to be a way for youth to safely engage and access services without having to worry about that, um, you know, and, and whatever that uh, in-between ground is to keep young people safe. Um, and another thing that's different about youth is that many young people are travelers and outreach workers aren't necessarily necessarily uh, able to return to the same place to find those youth again. Uh, so we know that a lot of outreach is done um, with through this progressive engagement process. So, um, you know, it is really important to be able to continue to go back and reconnect to build that trust. Um, so our outreach workers often uh, try to get to know the community network and build relationships with unhoused adults as well. Uh, who can potentially direct young folks to come to our access center or who can relay messages um, or maybe direct outreach workers to where youth may have last been seen. Um, and our outreach workers also uh, heavily rely on partnerships with schools and businesses and faith-based and community partners to uh, be those points of contact to um, help in locating youth. Um, and then another important tool is whenever we can offer immediate shelter or hotel voucher, um, not only is that consistent with the best practices of the Housing First model, but it's also an important resource for unsheltered youth specifically, um, so that supportive services teams can continue to locate those youth that they're trying to work with. Um, and I think that really underscores the importance for uh, you know, unsheltered youth in youth-centric settings um, and that access to resources. Um, and another reality for youth is that it is a unique sub subpopulation. So many providers are naturally not familiar with the youth uh, services system. And um, even being in this sector, don't necessarily know what exists to offer young people and end up directing them to the adult systems where many youth feel unsafe. 
Um, so in terms of recommendations for policymakers, I think what we need to make sure is that there are resources dedicated exclusively for youth specific shelter, housing, supportive services, um, so that youth aren't being routed to the adult system. Um, and you know, for that reason, we're so excited that our continuum of care was awarded the youth homeless demonstration program funding, and we need more opportunities like that. Um, and then again, the, the, the youth specific approach needs to be embedded into policies directed at ending homelessness, um, which is why as a partner with the Hollywood Homeless Youth Partnership, we were part of advocating that in implementing the uh, 4118 legislation that there needed to be a strategy specifically to outreach young people and provide services to youth uh, to avoid them being overlooked and underserved and over criminalized. Thank you so much, Erica. That was very informative. And thank you for providing insights into uh, potential policy recommendations. Very helpful. Peter, I want to turn to you, please. Um, working in homelessness and, uh, and around outreach in New York City, I know, is chal challenging and you have a very unique perspective. And, and that is also um, influenced by the fact that New York has a right to shelter policy. Just wondering, though, uh, do you still see some challenges to conducting outreach in New York City? We heard from Lyndon and we can see that there are some experiences that folks with lived experience are expressing in their um, lack of trust often with outreach workers. Can you tell us uh, about some of the challenges that you've seen out there to getting people into shelters? OK, um, actually, I um, I do something called one-offing people. It's like when people are in the street and they're willing to go into shelter, we have something called stabilization beds and we have something called safe haven beds. Um, because of COVID, most people are very geared towards having space by themselves. Um, and a lot of times, um, the way people are trained, people are trained to offer people um, central intake, um, and then eventually, possibly, as, as the people keep denying things, they're trained to offer them safe havens with a couple of people sharing a room. And because of COVID, people are frightened. Um, and on the other end, there's political policies um, in New York that go totally against CDC guidance, um, where people are, they've, they've actually been over 2,600 um, sweeps or cleanups in a four month period from March to July. It's been documented. Um, and that policy has terrorized the people on the street to the point where they hide in, in situations where at night they try to look like they're part of the garbage. Um, and for outreach workers to engage them um, because there's so many sweeps. Um, the people who are being engaged know that the outreach workers have to go put information in the databases and they sort of like surmise that because the information is going on where they are, the sweep is being motivated by what the outreach worker puts in the database. When in fact, what's happening is um, New York City set up a very negative political will where if you call 311 in order to um, report someone homeless and ask for an outreach team, instead of the operator doing that, what they will do is, are you making a nuisance call about a homeless person? And that's what generates DHS outreach not DHS outreach, but DHS sweeps, where they send police department, sanitation department, and on rare occasions, they'll send somebody from outreach. Um, and they're basically 
let the person know you can't be here, your stuff can't be here. You can go into a shelter, but you can take one bag with you and you're going through central intake. People are scared to death of central intake because of COVID um, and Delta, and they just refuse. People have opted to take their chances on the street for survival. This has been from the beginning of COVID. Um, there's a number of people who have been in shelter, have had bad experiences, and rather take their chances on the street. Um, the barrier for outreach is um, being able to offer something that will make a person feel safe um, and the resources. Um, a lot of people on the street want independent housing. Our, we have a bureaucracy in New York that's very much like a great maze if you're trying to house someone. It's the greatest maze in history. Um, we have HRA, we have DHS, um, and we have people on the street manage to survive. They have different types of hustles. They'll sweep a storefront. They'll do whatever they have to do um, in order to make um, money to survive. Um, we've had a work policy um, in New York where people have to work for, um, if they go into a shelter, they have to work for $22.50. Um, if they're on the street, they get more benefits, but they can get what the benefits pay for for free. And it's very hard to get people to um, get public, go after public assistance to, to be the other part of the subsidy for the housing. Yeah. Um, and actual housing is just a maze. It's, it's a true maze. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about the, the work you're doing um, at Homeless Can't Stay Home? And I think you've mentioned, you know, in, in that effort that oftentimes the shelter beds that are available, they're not sufficient. Can you really address that for okay. us? Okay, I can tell you about Homeless Can't Stay Home 30. Um, what happened was through urban justice and a coalition of um, homeless advocacy organizations, we started a GoFundMe. Um, 30 people, I think 10 of them I did referrals for, um, were housed in a hotel where they could have their own room, their own shower, um, if they got infected, they could um, basically isolate. They could isolate from becoming infected. Um, there weren't, there wasn't a million dollars in social service or there didn't have, there's no security. Um, they were contacted to do outreach. They went, they came to meetings. Um, we contacted HRA. We did, we found out how the system operates towards housing people. Um, we got homeless housing applications done because most people wanted independent housing. We submitted them to DHS, um, who further submitted them to HPD. And a lot of people, all of a sudden, right now, a lot of people are being housed. Um, those who have jobs get something called a soda voucher. People who don't have jobs um, use PA plus something called a city theft voucher, which has just risen from like $1,245 a month to $1,945 a month for one bedroom. Um, and we actually push for homeless set aside. Myself, I live in a homeless set aside. Um, I spent 10 years on the street on disability, um, just got involved. And like five months ago, I got a job. That's excellent. Um, now you're saving lives. My, my rent's going to be $2,500 a month now. <laughs> and I make 
maybe twice that a month. So we'll see. But anyway, um, the homeless are on your way. Did on a pilot. Your way. Yes, we did a pilot. And people are being coming housed. They were able to safely isolate. Um, they self monitored. Um, yeah, I heard you. We convinced the city to take over um, the payments for the GoFundMe, and the people are, are in their rooms. Um, those who have jobs go to work, come home. Um, those who don't, um, they isolate. They still know. The, the resources in Midtown. Um, the pilot was done in Midtown, but there's some places on the Lower East Side and in um, Long Island City where they stay. Mm -hmm. um, and one person who was staying in the Bronx and just got an apartment. Um, wow. But it, it's, it, it was a great pilot and we're hoping to get New York City to replicate it. Um, because it's like what's happening now isn't working. It's like people are terrorized on the street, but they're still not willing to go in because they don't have places where they can feel that they can truly isolate. And be safe. Be safe. Yeah. Peter, I'm going to shift over to John, but I thank you so much for your insights. It's very, very, very helpful. Um, John, I want to shift to you. Uh, there's a term that we often hear uh, service resistant. And I'm wondering um, what you think about that term. And having worked in homeless outreach uh, for over a decade, I know, maybe you could tell us about that term, whether or not you think it is an accurate description of the people we work with. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it is, uh, to be a contrarian, I guess. Uh, I mean, most people who are on the street are not getting the help they need. So as a consequence, they're going to not be particularly uh, amenable to the lack of services that are being provided. Um, uh, I mean, I run outreach teams and very much involved in the process of outreach. But I, I think outreach is, you know, which is we, we've talked a lot about credibility and transparency, um, trust building and how important all that is. But it's only important because we have nothing to offer them. If we had, if I, if all my outreach workers had a key to an apartment to walk out and say, hey, I can get you in, uh, you know, it's going to take about a month of the paperwork or we'll get you in, no problem. And if I had, you know, 12,000 of those for, for SPA 6, uh, all that trust building and, and transparency and credibility would be unnecessary. Uh, because people, we would have something simply to give people, uh, which is, of course, what they want. That's a whole autonomy piece. But we don't. So we have to work with that uh, lack of trust. Uh, and we have to do the slow work of, of hand-holding and, and recognizing people and caring for people uh, in order to uh, try to keep them engaged for this long process uh, uh, that gets us to um, hopefully to housing. Um, in in the, in the programs that I run, uh, part of our contract says that we need to do whatever it takes. Um, you know, that's actually written in the contract. So, uh, and that's what my teams are great at doing. Um, at uh, whatever whatever it takes to engage with someone, whatever it takes to uh, let somebody know that, that yeah, it's a, it's a crappy process, but it's a process that we're stuck with. Um, and, and please bear with us um, while we, while we um, get you where you need to go. Um, I love the uh, presentation that uh, Ms. Bond gave. Uh, uh, it really spelled out very specifically so much of the experience that, um, that I've had and sort of but put it in a different way. And so that was really, um, really good to hear. Um, yeah. So that's what I have to say about service resistant. Hell yes. I mean, of course they're service resistant. Uh, you can imagine being on, you know, you lose your house and, you know, for whatever reason you end up on the street and there's some billionaire going to the moon. Uh, of course it's an unfair system. I would not trust a, a minute of it. Uh, yeah. Service resistant. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. 
Sarah, let's have you close out this uh, round of questions and we'll continue on after you finish with other questions. But as a volunteer deeply involved in this work, you see a different side of homeless services than uh, we think a typical person who's out there who doesn't have a lot of direct knowledge of how the system works. And you've mentioned that a lot of your work focuses on connecting your housed and unhoused neighbors. What do you think are the most important things for house people to understand about their neighbors who are experiencing homelessness? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm just so also deeply honored to be on this panel with people who know so much more than me. And I serve as sort of a conduit and a translator, I think. So I'm just so grateful for all the work that everyone else is doing. Um, I also, there was a question in the chat and it was asked for clarity. SELA, I know is a religious term. We are non, a non-religious organization. It just happens to be the acronym for our original service areas, which were Silver Lake, Echo Park, Los Feliz, Atwater, and Hollywood. Um, and now we also work on the LA River and then have chapters in Eagle Rock and West Adams as well. So um, yeah, what are the things that it's important for house people to understand? Um, I think the main thing for us also is that beeping crazy loud. I'm so sorry. The trash man decided John right now. Um, the people experiencing homelessness in your neighborhood are your neighbors and they are people, right? That's sort of like the crux, I think, of what um, of what our work is um, with with our housed community. Um, I think that, you know, the bystander effect is very real and problematic. And so to get people to engage in a real human way with their unhoused neighbors is a, is, is a, is a big task. Um, and two of the things that we do, or one of the biggest things that we do is sort of debunk myths, like myth busting is like a big part of this. Um, two of the biggest ones are the conditions and causes of encampments. And the second one is service resistance, right? So, um, I'll actually start with the service resistance because Lyndon had such great things to say about it. Obviously, John just talked about it. I, I think, you know, it's such a catchphrase and I hear it so much with housed neighbors, like they don't want to be helped. They're service resistant, right? So I just wish we could take it out of the zeitgeist um, because it's not what people think it is. You know, it's not like, I don't need you. I'm fine. I hate this. It's, it is a lifetime of, of failed promises, right? Like Lyndon talked about like distrust. Um, and we try to help set the context for our house neighbors. So one of the things that I use all the time is that, I don't know if you've ever had a fight with an insurance company before, but it takes resources to engage with resources, right? So if you're fighting with your insurance company, you need reliable internet access. You need a phone full time. You need time to engage with that time, right? Like you need all of the foundations of success. Um, and most importantly, you need a constant point of contact. And none of those things are true for the people who are unhoused, who are trying to engage with this hugely burdened, overly complex system. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely the biggest thing is like, what is service resistance? Um, and, and we try to sort of take recontextualize that for people. The second myth that we try to bust is about kind of like what, what creates encampments? Why is someone living on the street? Um, I often hear people say like, oh, they're mentally ill and they've got a drug problem as if like that's what led to being unhoused when actually it's, it's often the other way around, right? People turn to substance abuse as a form of self-medication because they're experiencing a sustained trauma of living on the street, right? Like mental illness, you spend years and years with people failing to acknowledge that you exist. Like it's causing, it's disrupting your human experience. So trying to, to sort of flip that narrative and let people um, create empathy about, you know, it's oftentimes like domestic violence is leading to people being unhoused, um, medical bills. One of the biggest things that we end up working with people on is just trying to get their medical bills sort of wrangled under control, funded, any of that, that often leads to it. So um, yeah, I think, I think those are the, those are the big things that we spend a lot of our time on. Um, we also try to contextualize violence and um, uh, sort of like that impression of being unsafe. Again, the whole goal here is to get our house neighbors to engage with their unhoused neighbors, right? To like bring them together in a safe and productive way. Um, and so we try to show them that, you know, like you have this impression around an encampment being unsafe because 
real dangerous conditions exist in those spaces that are also dangerous for the people living there, right? So everyone involved is at risk and we are all involved at, in sort of changing that dynamic. Um, yeah, so I, I think that myth, that myth busting is, boy, where we spend a lot of time where you have to, people say the wildest things to you and you just have to be like, okay, I'm gonna believe in my heart of hearts that you're not horrible and don't understand what you've just said. And let's try to think through like where you got that impression. Um, the very real social barrier between housed and unhoused individuals really can be broken down and replaced with empathy. Um, and so like, that's that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. And I have more, but I, I feel like we've, we've all talked a lot. So thank you again to everyone. Thank you, Sarah. That really warms my heart. And I appreciate you being the person that's clarifying what people may be seeing in service resistance. We really don't believe that people who are unhoused are resisting help. I, I see it as um, people who have adapted to a lifestyle that's inhumane, that they've started to believe is all they have to look forward to. And it's our jobs to debunk that for them, to help them see that there is more to life for them and that we can help them get on the path to restoring that sense of, of, of dignity and hope. So thank you for doing such a good job clarifying that, Sarah. Really appreciate it. I saw that someone in the chat, and we're gonna to get to questions in just a bit, but I saw that someone in the chat was asking about like data. You know, how do we track our work? How do we track our work on the Oceanfront Walk? And um, Veronica, I can let you um, raise that as well. I'm, I'm happy to help with that question because we track um, the outcomes and data every single day uh, and still are. And then maybe um, Erica, John, you all can also weigh in on how do you measure your success? How do you know if your outreach efforts are working or not? Sorry, I was muted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, internally, we we actually uh, our data team um, has created several databases that we utilize internally, um, and with that, we're able to track all of our data real time. We have um, several different contact sheets and different things and questionnaires where we're able to collect data from clients. Um, and then from there, it is pretty much streamlined into a more centralized database where we share that amongst other agencies. Um, clients pretty much sign a release of information where we're able to share their information collectively um, amongst agencies in order to be able to connect them uh, to services. And so the same, we did, the, so I followed the same procedure on Oceanfront Wall, where we were able to collect uh, clients' data um, and, and, and still now, you know, where they're at and um, what services they were connected to and where they went. That's right. And since I'm at St. Joseph Center and know very well this uh, project, I just want to add that we used drone technology of the boardwalk initially. Um, our great leader, Dewan Moses, who's our director of outreach, is brilliant. And if you want to know more about what we did on Ocean Front Walk, that's the person you want to talk to. But he um, used drone technology to identify how many encampments uh, were on the boardwalk, how many people. We estimated that there were about 200 and about that same number or more of um, encampments or tents. And so he numbers them. He actually creates a small community map. He knows, num you know, each encampment is numbered, each tent is numbered, so that we can actually connect with people. We know who's there and we can make sure that every single person who's there gets the resources, services, and housing that they need. And we do it, uh, again, as I said, zone by zone. And ultimately, after a six-week period, we were able to house 211 and now 213. A couple more got in there after we ended the project. And yes, every single day we collect data and I push it out to all the partners. Erica, John, did you want to weigh in a little bit on how you measure success? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, I love hearing about everybody's innovative approaches. It's really uh, incredible to be able to learn from each other. Um, and uh, so our outreach teams are tracking their contacts. Um, we also have a number of different tracking systems uh, where we're capturing that data. 
um, you know, the ways in which we are measuring success are the number of youth points of contact who we are ultimately able to connect to services and housing specifically. Um, one of the strategies that we use because we are trying to do that trust building is to have our outreach team spend some period of their time at our access center so that the faces that young people are seeing out in the community are also the faces that they're seeing at our gates when they arrive. Um, and so, you know, when young folks come into the access center, we are uh, inputting their information so that we can, you know, cross-reference it to uh, the folks that we've con connected with out in the field. Thank you. John, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I just want to say something sort of specific to outreach that, you know, every every week in our, our staff meetings, uh, you know, we have successes that that the teams bring up and and we're very specific that they are outreach successes. We our successes are always did we house somebody, you know, did we did we get them connected into whatever, you know, whatever thing it is. But for the outreach successes is did we learn that guy's name? That's a big one. Uh, sometimes, you know, for some clients, it's no problem. I, I'm Jerry Jones, whatever it is. But, uh, but for a lot of some clients, getting somebody's name after six months of working with them, you know, and visiting and visiting or, or, you know, can we can we actually get you to come out of your tent, you know, uh, whatever it is, uh, we, we look at those things as successes, and we make sure that everybody understands that success is based on the client's journey, not our journey. So I love that so much, John. I got a um, text message the other morning and one of our staff members uh, had a selfie with someone that we've been engaging and trying to engage for over a year. And she had a thumbs up and it was a selfie. And it was like breakthrough. Like you said, that's success uh, in the terms of outreach. What does it mean to connect with a client? She's given a thumbs up and she's saying yes to a selfie. That's huge. So Sarah, we have a question for, for you from Abby. Uh, and I'm going to read it. Have you seen success in myth busting? And how are you doing that? Is it on and off conversations with community members who complain? Or are you proactively going out to have those conversations? Any success stories you can share would be helpful. And she says, as a government official who is responsible for being a liaison between our unsheltered neighbors, the county and our house neighbors, this is a large part of my job. And she's interested in hearing how you're doing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, I will be completely honest that sometimes it's not successful. There are people who will come to you and you can tell that they already, I mean, just like any argument, they come to you with their preconceived notions fully formed and there is no answer in the world outside of like brainwashing that would would change the way they want to think about the problem they just want to complain um but one of the things I will say is that even in those moments right like people have said just truly horrifying things in those one-off moments I do try very hard and we try at Sela to recognize that that's coming from a place of fear um and so if you if you can address that if you can acknowledge that that's where we find our success most often Often is saying like, I hear you, you feel unsafe in your neighborhood, right? What can we do to address that? Oftentimes that is just straight up introducing people. So yeah, some of it is one off and some of it is like someone will come to an encampment, see us doing outreach and only engage with us and sort of like shifting the voice, right? Like taking our voice out of it and putting the voice of the person who is living in the encampment with the person who is housed, right? So like connecting them directly. And we often find success in those moments because it demystifies, again, it's like myth busting. We all have this stuff. Um, so so those are often really helpful in terms of proactivity. Um, as an organization, um, we are sort of looking at our role as an advocate and an educating unit as an entity. And so we're looking at ways to do that. This is one of those things, you know, we'll do panels like this. We'll put our own subject matter experts into public spaces like this. Um, but as individuals, again, because we're a volunteer agency, most of us aren't limiting our activities to what we're doing with SELA. Like I personally am a renter and I personally drag my neighbors out and like have conversations with my HOA when they try to put really um, discriminatory things in place about like, like anything, anything, putting barbed wire up around our cans for some, you know, like any of those practices that are just like small and violent and that we don't need. So those are the proactive things that I think we do as individuals. Um, I would actually be very happy to connect with anyone because we have had 
some, some pretty good successes, both with having our house neighbors engage with our unhoused neighbors. And also in that whole service resistance piece of like relationship building to connecting with care workers for our unhoused neighbors and like getting, bringing those relationships to fruition. Thank you so much, Sarah. And for those of you who are listening in, uh, please send us your questions. If anything has come up, uh, anything that particularly resonates, we'd love to answer your questions. Peter, you have mentioned this, um, you know, sort of fear of that so many unhoused folks, uh, you know, feel that sense of vulnerability out there. And I think it's um, really helpful for people to hear and understand what that looks like. Can you talk about the fear that so many unhoused folks uh, are feeling these days. Okay, um, New York City is a large city with a lot of people who've been out of work, um, who've had to go on public assistance. Um, that the only reason that they're still housed is because we've had, a, it's like across the country there's been rent moratorium. And I'll give you a perfect example. This morning, I went to visit someone in the street and the person who cleans up for a building near them um, was cackling about the person. And I looked in his eyes and it's like, I was very well aware that as like the maintenance person from a, for another building, um, his situation is that if he loses that job and that income, he may become the person that he objects to seeing. That's the big fear. That it's like we have lots of rich people who might have some objection to seeing, oh, our property values are going down. But if you're rich enough, you're not worried about your property values because this is New York City. Um, but for people who are struggling, um, the sight of the homeless person is like a picture that it's like a nightmare that you have a fear of becoming part of, to becoming the main, you fear becoming that person. I've um, been on the train in the person panhandle and I looked at him and it's like, I've seen you like the nails are dirty. This is not a con artist, but I've gotten off of that train and heard a construction worker, um, no offense to feminism, but a female construction worker say, I would never give a dime to a grown man asking for funding, but She, if she didn't have that job, she might be in a situation that person's in. And whenever people have, I've seen security guards at night on the subways, they're going to work and they start talking about the homeless people. And because their salaries aren't exactly phenomenal in New York City, um, if they miss a few days, they're at risk of becoming that person. I personally worked three jobs over a period of 32 years and was technically homeless. But I worked and I worked and I worked and actually until I became disabled and was um, on the street for 10 years um, as a World Trade Center survivor, I couldn't pull it together to get housed. And I got a lot of help. The agency hired me, a lot of help, along with the 30 people um, who are part of Homeless Can't Stay Home, um, actually getting through the bureaucracy we have is the hardest part of housing anybody in New York City. We don't have enough supportive housing, but the supportive housing we have, a lot of people are afraid to go into because people are horrified of catching COVID. And we have um, an opportunity to create housing that's more independent with space. Um, but there's powers that be who have a concept of the bang for the buck. 
Mm-hmm. And like my view of it is forget the bank for the buck. Um, consider the whole community safer. If you can put somebody in a space where they can cook for themselves or somebody can come in and cook for them, whatever needs to happen for that person to be safe, you have uplifted the standard of living in your community. That's good. Yes. Well, thank you, Peter. And I I think I want to, in the interest of time, give each of our panelists an opportunity to close out just like Peter did your closing comments on outreach uh, on outreach and engagement, on saving lives, the empathy and care that Peter mentioned. Um, maybe you can all close this out uh, with a brief comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and I think one, uh, you know, takeaway that um, I want to leave folks with is that, you know, as the adults out there, that uh, you all can be part of this solution. And one way in which we continue to try to engage folks is um, with volunteers uh, accompanying our outreach teams. And so I think that uh, recognizing, you know, where folks are coming from and hearing their stories directly and building those relationships uh, is really powerful. um, And I think really helps uh, you know, build that trust again and, uh, you know, really bring people uh, to a place where they feel safe enough to access services and believe uh, somebody's intentions and that they are not going to, um, you know, return to the circumstances that, that uh, you know, were harmful and, and caused their, their homelessness. Thank you. John? Uh uh, yeah, just closing, I'll say, yeah, housing works. So uh, if there's a solution to this. It's uh, voting for people who are going to uh, help us build more, uh, build more housing. And that may increase density and whatever that is. But but that's what we need to do. So housing, housing works. Yes. Veronica. So I also like to just I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be a panelist and share my experience with you all. Um, as an outreach worker, I think that the biggest thing, a couple things, one, um, there's a big difference between sympathy and empathy. And I believe that, you know, empathy goes a long way um, and really just trying to, again, understand where a person is coming from and allow them to be the one um, to help you define those successes for them. Um, don't force anyone to do things that they don't want to do. Um, and, and just, you know, be a loving person, you know, just love your neighbors. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm very, I love the work that I do and I'm eager to, to be out there every day uh, serving the population and, Uh, just helping them on their journey, whatever that may be. Thank you, guys. Sarah? Yeah, I also want to double down on there's a difference between empathy and sympathy, and I think that's a really important one. Um, I I also would like to echo that, you know, the conversation is changing, and I, I think one of the things that's really heartening for me is I hear the voices of people experiencing homelessness being more and more elevated. For years, you just didn't even hear them in this conversation, um, and I'm seeing opportunities in which their voices are being elevated, but it needs to be more, and I think we need to elect people who are willing to keep having this conversation. It is hard. Like, there are solutions. Um And, uh, but we just need to keep, we just need to keep having the conversation. I also just want to say to my, like my fellow panelists and everyone else who's a practitioner, I know we all get siloed because it's the only thing you can do in this system is just like focus up and, um, and, and just do your job. And it can feel very isolating either between agencies or as an individual. And I, I just want to say, I find this very heartening because it's good to every once in a while, sort of pop your head out and say like, oh, we're in an ocean of helpers. Um, and so just thank you. Thank you. And we got a, a very last minute question, but it is so relevant. So Gary, if you don't mind, I just want to raise it. Uh, it's from Tony White. And the person says um, that an issue that needs to be addressed is paying a, a living wage to our outreach workers. Uh, many work as part of the solutions, person says, while remaining a step away from homelessness themselves. This phenomenon increases the probability of compassion fatigue and burnout. Uh, And Veronica has her hand raised, so I'll let you speak first. 
Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I, I actually just I'd like to really speak to my agency. Um, you know, our agency is very, very, very big, 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 big on self-care. Um, again, as I had, you know, stated to everyone before, I, I started in the agency as an outreach worker. Um, and I, I'm sorry, as a, as a peer specialist, which is, you know, the entry level. Um, and, you know, we're paid, you know, fair living wages. And again, you know, we, we have so many different things, um, benefits and things that the agency provides as far as again, for our self-care and ensuring that we are able to um, do the work that we do, because this is hard work. It is stressful. Um, and a lot of it falls back on us. It is easy to get burned out. I mean, you know, very, very quickly, um, if you're not practicing self-care. And so again, you know, our agency is really, really big. Even when COVID hit, that was something that was really, really, you know, big for me, the support that we as outreach workers, because we were on the front lines, and we receive so much support from our agency, um, constantly checking in, te you know, our temperatures and making sure that, you know, mentally we were OK, physically we were OK and different things like that. Um, so, yes, it, it is important. And, and I apologize. That I can only speak for our agency and where, you know, as it relates to this. But um, I do feel that if, you know, folks are looking to make those transitions in their lives, um, the first step is is as an outreach worker, and you know every again at, in any position there's an out there is an entry level, um, and I've been promoted twice since I've been with St. Joseph Center, and you know it just it just feels really good. I mean, really like my life is just so different, and um, and I believe that others can have those same successes. Tony asked specifically about wages. And so we do track and are required to pay a living wage and um, try to make sure that we're staying ahead of making sure that our people are not on the brink of homelessness. We also have a program where if anybody who works for the agency ends up in a bind, we uh, can give them a loan, which they have 12 months to pay back interest free to get them back on their feet. So we think that's really important. But more importantly, and I know John's organization did this as well, Hoptix did this, Veronica and her leadership uh, was that we paid, um, we were allowed to pay our essential staff, line staff, outreach workers, hazard pay. And we thank LASA and we thank our funders for allowing us to do that. It was very important during such a tragic and difficult time that we were able to compensate our frontline for putting their lives at risk every single day to keep us all safe. So I just want to add that. I also want to thank all of you for joining us. And I'm going to hand it over to Gary. Uh, and Gary, thank you again for allowing us to share. Thank you, Felicia. And thank you for everyone for joining us. I think the perspectives that we saw here are, are very clear um, and give us ways forward. Um, just as a, a side note, you know, one of the things that HPRI does is we try to compile what is the state of the cutting edge research on a variety of topics, including this one. So I invite you to go to the research catalog and, and learn what, you know, our best practices around outreach. But in many ways, we saw that demonstrated here today. We we saw that there still remains a lot of fear in our communities around our unhoused neighbors and, and what can and should be done. But there is a path forward. And I, I think we all heard that today. So once again, I just want to thank everyone for joining us in the audience. I thank our panelists again, and I look forward to connecting with all of you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.